This is reporter Julie Spencer and I'd like to welcome you to Newsline, Iowa City. Please join me today as we take a trip to Old Capitol. Once the main government building for the state of Iowa, it is now the most prominent landmark on the University of Iowa campus. Tour guide supervisor Aaron Hullabrit will give us a historical perspective of Old Capitol and take us on a tour of the building. Well, the story of Old Capital begins in 1838 when they opened the Iowa Territory for settlement. Uh, they convened in Burlington as the capital, which is a town on the Mississippi River. However, they wanted a capital further in the interior. The following year, they sent three commissioners out into the wilderness to find a new site for the capital. They ended up coming right over where the current Old Capital is, driving a stake in the ground, and that's where they began building the building. They laid the cornerstone on the 4th of July, 1840. Uh, however, they weren't able to move in until 1842. Uh, now, it served as the territorial capital for the Iowa Territory up until 1846 in December when we became the 29th state in the Union. We only served as the state capital for not very long, only from 1846, just at the end, to 1857. By 1857, the state population had expanded all the way from the Mississippi River to the Missouri River, and as people were moving westward, there was a lot of concern that if the capital was over in the eastern part of the state, it uh, wouldn't be very geographically uh, equidistant from everyone and be less fair to all the representatives coming to work here. And so they wanted to place it right in the middle and they ended up choosing Des Moines, which is obviously where it stayed. Uh, if you'd like to follow me, we will go and take a look at some of the rooms in the building. Now it said that the southwest corner of any building's rooms uh, usually gets the best sunlight, at least later in the afternoon. And so uh, the governor, it is said, uh, actually got first pick of all the offices and he chose the southwest corner room. You can see the governor's desk over here, very large. It may seem cartoonish, but even 150, 160 years ago, really the only writing utensils that they continue to have were quill pens. Most of the quill pens uh, in the old capital are goose's feathers. Many of the fancier desks you'll see are actually bound with leather. Uh, leather would actually create a soft surface since quill pens are actually quite sharper than the pens we write with today. It was very important you had to be careful when you were writing with one, otherwise you would just shred through the paper. One thing that's very prevalent in the old capital are these spittoons. In the mid-19th century, everybody chewed chewing tobacco. Men, women, uh, even teenagers, everyone but the smallest of children would engage in chewing chewing tobacco. Um, now, as a culture, we tend to be more familiar with the brass ones that make the wonderful ding sound when we spit into them. Those did exist, but for the most part, ceramic ones were much more popular. Uh, the reason for ceramic spittoons popularity is located on the side. You can see it was very easy to put a hole in the side of the spittoon, which would be a large advantage when it came time to clean it out. Uh, you can see you can just pour the contents out through the side without actually having to get in there yourself and clean it. And so much more popular, although less remembered. Now, we're in the treasurer's office. All of the state taxes would have wound up in this room. Uh, you can see there is a safe in the corner. That's not actually the original safe to the building, however. It's a period safe from the 1850s that we reacquired. Now, this safe weighs about 3,100 pounds. No special reinforcements or anything holding it up. However, the original safe was so large, in fact, that you could walk inside it, and there was actually a bank vault that led into the basement. The treasurer's desk, uh, most people assume that it would have been the largest desk in the room. Uh, the treasurer's desk actually would have been out and facing towards the people so that he could interact with various individuals who likely came in to complain about the amount of taxes. This is actually an interesting artifact that we reacquired. Inside this very large leather box with a velvet interior is actually a man's hat. Uh, clothing, we have to remember, was very expensive at the time and so they had to take very good care of the clothing they had. Uh, so hopefully this hat uh, with such a large box and nice interior would last most of your life. Uh, you might even try and pass it down to your kids if it was in good condition when you were done with it.
Uh, now, money was slightly different uh, in the mid-19th century. Uh, anyone could print their own money, and it was all a matter of whether that money would be accepted uh, or you could, if you could convince the other person that it was worth that amount. So states would actually print their own money. Uh, you can see here is a $3 bill for the state of Iowa. Uh, this would only be accepted within our particular state if you tried to take this back to the East Coast, they probably would not accept it as a valid form of payment. Uh, to make matters worse, cities would actually print their own money. Here is a $2 bill for the city of Iowa City. This would probably only be accepted in maybe the Johnson County area. Even if you tried to take this to another city within Iowa, it probably would not be accepted. If that were not complicated enough, businesses actually printed their own money. Here is a 10 cent stub for a place called Toosley Saloon. Now it's called Stumptail Currency. Stumptail Currency was slang at the time for money that wouldn't be accepted somewhere. And so uh, I suppose he had a bit of a sense of humor about uh, this little slip of paper, but uh, it probably would only be a valid payment at that particular saloon. We are now in the state library. There was about 1,500 books in the original collection. They ranged everything from a history of North Carolina to letters of a Turkish spy. Now we've recovered over 1,000 of them, 543 of which are on display in this room. They are all original. The reason that we know that they're original is we found on the 30th page of each one of these books written in quill pen uh, the words Iowa State Library. Now they would do this as a safeguard uh, so that anyone coming into the room uh, would not be able to steal the book. Uh, if you were intending to steal the book, you would probably rip the cover off thinking uh, that's where everything was written that would be able to track you down. Well, no one's going to think to look on the 30th page, right? Uh, if you rip that out, you more or less just ruin the book. And so that was not only their way of safeguarding their collection, but it was a way for uh, researchers to go back and make sure that all of these books were in the original collection. Uh, just a note on lighting, then and now, the primary source of lighting for the building has been the windows. Um, you can see on sort of a gloomy day like today, we don't get a lot of light despite the electricity that we still have. Other than the windows, you really had two sources, candles and whale's oil. Uh, whale's oil lamps ranged everything from these. This is what's called a sandwich glass lamp, a very fancy fixture for something that would have been holding burning animals fat. Uh, whale's oil had a number of problems. Number one, there are very few whales in Iowa, and so it was very expensive to import all of this to the American frontier. Uh, number two, uh, as I said, it's burning animals fat, uh, so it doesn't smell that great. Uh, and then number three, it would emit sort of a black fume that would hang in the air, stick to things, and get the building fairly dirty. Now we can see here a brass spittoon, so uh, they did exist, and they might make that wonderful ding sound when you spit into it. Um, however, you can see it's harder with metal working to insert a hole in the side, and so uh, when it came time to clean it out, you would have to get in there and use your hand, and so much less popular for that reason. We're now in the Supreme Court chamber. You can see uh, there was three justices that originally served on the court. Uh, there would have been no jury for the Supreme Court since being the highest court of the land, everything would have been decided by the three Supreme Court justices. They would have done this with an interpretation of the Iowa State Law Code, which functions more or less as our state constitution. Uh, that was written originally in 1846 to found our state, and then amended one last time in 1857, right before they left for Des Moines. Uh, if you'd like to see the Iowa State Law Code, in the rear of the room, entirely contained within this secretary, this is more or less our state constitution, uh, the 1857 edition uh, written in the House chamber. Sort of an interesting fact, Iowa is one of 10 states in the United States that has never canceled its constitution and started afresh. And so uh, the laws that were written in here a good 150, almost 160 years ago are still the ones that we technically follow today. Uh, one more interesting fact in the Supreme Court chamber, uh, there were no drinking fountains, of course, and so uh, really what they relied upon were these. Uh, sort of looks like the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz. Uh, this is actually the watering can for the Supreme Court chamber. Uh, this would have been shared by everyone. Uh, judges, both lawyers, uh, spectators in the room would have all come back and shared the same watering can. What's more, they all would have shared the same cup. 
So it probably was not too hygienic or sanitary to be sharing one cup with 30 or 40 other men all probably chewing, chewing tobacco, mind you, uh, and never having brushed their teeth in their life. Now probably the outstanding feature of the building is this. Uh, it's called a self-supporting reverse spiral staircase. A very rare, there are very few of them in the United States. Uh, the reason for this is that almost all spiral staircases will ascend to the right. This one actually ascends to the left. It's entirely self-supporting and so uh, you may notice sort of um, what look like pipes leading down to it. Uh, those are just called stabilizers. Uh, they cause the staircase to look like it's being suspended. However, the only thing they do is prevent the staircase from shaking back and forth. Legend has it that they were installed in the 1920s when uh, quite a few students were going up to class and were having too much fun shaking the staircase back and forth. While well, the professors upstairs did not believe that was a very good idea and had stabilizers installed uh, so that the students would not be able to have too much fun. Uh, now the original staircase was designed by John Francis Ragu, who won a nationwide contest to design the entire building. However, he had sort of a short temper. He did not like that the building was being built out of limestone. And so he actually took off of the blueprints about nine days into construction. Uh, the construction workers were left with sort of a large designed uh, elaborate staircase that uh, they didn't have the exact measurements for but had a pretty good idea of what it should look like. Fortunately after they built it one handrail was about 10 inches higher than the other one and so in the 1920s there was a large renovation to the building where they decided to replace it. That is when we got our second staircase. Now we are currently in the Senate chamber of the old Capitol. There was only 13 senators that served here originally, uh, so you may be wondering why they needed so many chairs. Uh, the reason for this, this is one of two rooms in Old Capitol uh, that's not restored to the Capitol time period, but rather the 1920s. At the time, it was a lecture hall. However, this room has been quite a number of things over the years. Uh, it was the original location for the main library. It was the original location for the registrar's office, uh, the Museum of Natural History, the law library. Nearly every department of the university was in the Senate chamber at one time. The chandelier, it's a very fancy chandelier. It has over 1,000 pieces, 750 of which are real crystals. We clean it once to twice a year. Each crystal has to be taken off individually, wiped down, and put back on. Uh, so a very time-consuming and delicate process. This is the house chamber for uh, the old capital. So uh, the House of Representatives would have met over here. This is actually the room where our state constitution or law code was practiced in 1846. Also actually the room where the university was founded the following year in February, February 25th of 1847 actually. Uh, that was done as an official act of the state legislature in this room. Architecturally speaking, they were very fond of uh, optical illusions at the time and so uh, you can see that it, most things in the room are really coming out red uh, as far as the paint and the curtains. The one thing that serves to sort of naturally draw your eye is this large green curtain. Now this was specifically put here uh, to be in front of the Speaker of the House's desk and so that when all these lawmakers came in they would naturally be looking towards the center of the room, very conveniently above the desk of the person they're supposed to be paying attention to in the first place. Uh, there was 26 representatives that originally served in the original Iowa House Chamber. Uh, you can see uh, there is a reproduction for each of them based on the original designs of the desk and the chairs that they would have sat in. Uh, they each would have received a quill pen and blotter of ink as well as a candle to light their ways. As you can tell, it does get a little dark in here and they might have worked some late nights. That concludes the tour of Old Capitol, but there's much more information that we weren't able to get into today. So I invite you all to come back and visit us. Uh, we're open 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday, uh, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Thursdays and Saturdays, and 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. on Sundays.